Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, this month we have been going back through our legacy interviews with some of the best guests that we've had. And one of the individuals that we had way back in 2018, who you actually can't get to do a podcast interview anymore, he is that busy, is Chris Voss, who is a former FBI negotiator, hostage negotiator, and he wrote the book Split the Difference, and he has just been flat out busy. His notoriety has gone through the roof. So we wanted to repost this one, and one of the things we talk about in the show is just the importance of, you know, when we're having influence, when we talk about negotiation, that really is the power of influence. And that means our level of emotional intelligence. And that's one of the things that CRG really does help you with, is help you to understand yourself, understand others, increase that self-awareness, that self-management, and that self-mastery, and of course, emotional intelligence. And one of the things we want to recommend, if you already haven't done so, is consider one of our e-courses. The Personal Style Indicator is now the number one personality assessment as rated by participants globally. I mean, over all other personality assessments. So the personal style indicator is now number one globally. And so you can go to our site, crgleader.com, look up the personal style indicator, or take the e-course, Why Aren't You More Like Me?, which is based on my book from the same name. And we go in depth about how to apply personal style to our emotional intelligence, to our awareness, to really our overall effectiveness and fulfillment in life. If you like what we're doing here with Secrets of Success, please pass it on, share it, leave a positive review in whatever platform you're listening on. And I do appreciate that you have been part of the tribe and listening to us for these over five years that we have been on the air. So here's a great interview with the author of Split the Difference, Chris Voss. Welcome to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keyes. Well, today's show is very interesting. I just finished interviewing Chris Voss. Now, Chris is a former FBI lead international kidnap negotiator. So Chris was with the FBI for 24 years. He led the team. He worked in many situations where he was teaching people and also part of the negotiations. The other thing that Chris has now done is he's written a new book called Never Split the Difference. And Chris now works with businesses, organizations to help create an environment for successful negotiations. Now, for those of you that are listening, is before we get into meeting Chris, every single person listening to this show is negotiating something at some point or another. Your teenager's negotiating how long they want to stay out at night. Uh, the spouse trying to, uh, your partner's negotiating where you want to go for a holiday. Your employees are negotiating wages, or you're negotiating with somebody to hire them or a business contract to get a new business. So every single person is constantly communicating. And one of the things that is shared in the beginning of the show, now there are many gems as we get into the tail end of the show, so listen to the entire show, is really around one of the core things, the core things that CRG teaches and what we do here is around emotional intelligence. Do you know yourself? So just a little sidebar, you know, as you listen to this show with Chris Voss, is that you think about your emotional intelligence. Think about what is your personal style. So if you haven't completed one of our assessments there, think about your values assessment. Think about the leadership skills, if that's an area that you're in and you want to complete that assessment from us. That's one of the areas that we live in where we're really helping people to create self-awareness. And then listen to Chris and some of the items that he has. It's out of his book, Never Split the Difference. So thank you for listening to the Secrets of Success podcast. If you like what we're doing, please share, pass it on, let other people know about it, leave a positive comment. We thank you very much for allowing us to serve you. Here's Chris Voss. We actually have an individual who has just voted one of the top 100 leadership speakers in the world by Inc. 
Magazine, a former FBI hostage negotiator, and he's written the book, Never Split the Difference. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris Voss. Rob, uh, Chris, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. I am happy to be here. Thank you. And Chris, we were just talking off air. You moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, and because I'm on the West Coast now, I think more highly of you as part of that. So uh, th it's going to go better for <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Chris, you were with the FBI for 24 years, but before we get into that part of your career, just tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and just sort of your journey as a kid and some of your family background? Just You know, I know my voice doesn't sound like it because of the time that I spent in New York, but I'm originally from a small town in Iowa. I'm a small town Midwestern guy son of Richard Joyce Voss, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Uh, there are more people in the building I lived, uh, I worked in in New York City than were in the town I grew up in. Wow. You know, got into law enforcement, ended up an FBI agent, became a hostage negotiator with the FBI. Now, if with the law enforcement side, here you are in Iowa, what was sort of the background of your parents? What, were they in farming? Were they in something different? What, was, what were they doing? Yeah, all right, small town now, so I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm. A very clear distinction where I grew up. You know, the uh, kids who grew up on farms actually called me a city kid, if you could imagine that, a city of 7,000 people. <laughs> yeah, my father was an entrepreneur. He had, he had his own business. He was a very entrepreneurial guy. I grew up in an entrepreneurial environment, blue-collar approach to life, hardworking, you know, do what you got to do to get it done. And usually you got to figure it out on your own. And my well, son and I always joke, one of the unofficial boss models is how hard can it be? Did you go directly into the FBI or what was before that? No, you can't, unless you're a scientist or an accountant or an attorney, you can't go directly into the FBI, usually from school. Um, they, like, they like you to have at least some real world experience. And I didn't plan on going into the FBI originally, but I, I was a police officer. I was a cop in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, for three years after I graduated college. And what was really the motivation behind law enforcement for you? What, what was driving that sort of career direction? You know, I got to tell you, when I was a teenager, I saw a movie called The Super Cops. And it was about two police officers in New York City. And I was just blown away at how creative those guys were and how much fun they had and how much good they did. And I thought, you know, I, I kind of like all that. That's pretty cool. I could, I could, I could dig something like that. And uh, I wanted to be in law enforcement. You know, from seeing that move. Now, how was what was your uh, experience like when you were in Kansas, as far as law enforcement? Kansas. Was did did it fulfill sort of what the movie said, or did it go in a different direction? I wasn't in Kansas City, Kansas. I was Kansas City, Missouri. You know, we we no. got to understand the difference. They're very very important <laughs> regional things. Very important. Okay, so when you were there, and thank you for correcting me. That's perfect. What what was the experience there in those three years that you were on the force there? Well, you know, I, I loved it. I loved the first year a lot more uh, the most because I was in a commercial area. You know, law enforcement has different aspects. If you're in a commercial area, basically, you know, there's a lot more street life. You know, one might argue that maybe I had ADD. I, need, I needed stuff going on a constant, regular basis. I, I liked, uh, liked working in commercial, industrial areas, bars, restaurants, bad guys on the street. That kind of stuff, and and then, uh, but after my first year, I got rotated to a residential area. That's a different ball game. Slower, it's much more meticulous, and I am not a slow, meticulous guy. <laughs> so I started, I started to get a little bit bored with it, and then I was also, I was also on the list to go to the SWAT team. I tried out for the SWAT team, and I was, uh, I did really well in, in the in the, the tryouts. But um, now, where did that opportunity come from, Chris? Well, my father was disappointed that I was a police officer. And to some degree, you know, he just got done uh, foot in the bell for a four-year college education. And I went out and got a job that didn't require a college education. So, you mm. know, if, if I paid for a college degree and my son didn't go get a job that he needed it for, I'd be a little disappointed. You know, he had higher aspirations for me. So, but he knew that I was committed to law enforcement. So he had a buddy that was a Secret Service agent. And he wanted me to talk to this guy, and I spoke to him on the phone. And this guy said, you know, I travel all over the world. And I remember thinking, really? I could have a job where I could, people would pay me to travel all over the world? I, I, that might be interesting. So as fate would have it, to my good fortune, the Secret Service was not hiring. 
the FBI was. And I thought, you know, that's a, that's a different set of federal mm-hmm. alphabet letters there. What could the difference be? I'll put it for the FBI. And uh, the Bureau uh, ended up uh, having a real big hiring push at that time, first a, first of a big three-year push. And I kind of snuck in the door with a bunch of other people and it ended up being perfect for me. Wow. Now, you went over to Quantico. Did you go and train there? Yeah, you're going you're gonna to be an FBI agent. You've got to go through the Academy of Quantico. There's no, there's no two ways about that. And Quantico is a really cool place it, where lives are transformed. You know, you, you go in citizen and you come out an FBI agent. That's kind of a cool thing. And it really, it really is transformative. So, yeah, I went, I went to Quantico. Now, you get into FBI, and, of course, then there's all kinds of specialties within it. How did this whole area of negotiations, especially sort of hostage negotiations, come into play, and how did that evolve for you? Yeah, you know, most law enforcement agencies have additional specialties you can do besides your day job, if you will. Um, You know, like if you're an FBI agent, you could get interested. Maybe you want to blow things up so you become a bomb tech. Maybe you want to be in a SWAT team. Maybe you want to be a negotiator. Maybe you want to be an undercover. It kind of it, it's kind of how you're built. I was originally on a SWAT team. I got on the SWAT team in the Pittsburgh uh, office of the FBI, and then uh, injured my knee in the process of trying out for the bureau's version of the Navy SEALs, um, uh, which would be the hostage rescue team. Now I know the SEALs don't see the hostage rescue team as their equivalent, uh, but you know that's friendly competition. Of course. But then I hurt, I hurt my knee for it, and, and, but I still want to be in crisis response. I knew we had hostage negotiators. Again, you know, the boss motto, how hard could it be? I, I decided I want to be a hostage negotiator. I, was, I went to the head of the hostage negotiation team in uh, New York City and was summarily rejected. And, uh, and what was the main reason they rejected you with the first time? I was eminently unqualified. <laughs> <laughs> so I, went, I went to Amy Bondro and I said, hey, you know, kind of like, ta-da, here I am. I want to be a hostage negotiator. And she kind of went, yeah, really? You know, I can, I can kind of remember Amy looking down her nose at me over her glasses from her desk. And she was like, all right, so, okay, fine. Everybody wants to be a hostage negotiator. You got any experience? I know you're a cop. Were, were you a negotiator in the police department? I said, nope. She said, you got any training as a therapist, any, any, any sort of training whatsoever? I said, nope. She said, you got, you got a degree in psychology. You had any sort of educational credentials at all? Uh, nope. And she, she finally said, no, you can't do it. Go away. You're, you know, everybody wants to be a hostage negotiator. It sounds cool. It sounds easy. You got no qualifications. Go away. And I said, you know, oh, come on. You know, there's got to be something I could do. And she said, there is. Now, go volunteer on a suicide hotline. Now, until you've done that, go away. And I got, I, got back, I got back to her about five months later. And I said, hey, I want you to know I've been on a hotline for about five months. And she's, she said, you kid. And I said, I said, no, no, you told me to do it. I did it. She says, I tell everybody to do that. Nobody does it. You know, a- Amy, by, far, by being smart enough to ask the right person what to do and then doing it, she jumped me over five other people that went online. She really became an unofficial mentor for me from that point forward. Wow. And what was the suicide hotline experience like, Chris? You know, it's pretty cool. What it is, it's high intensity uh, training and emotional intelligence. And that's all it is. I mean, it is a master class on, on EQ, emotional intelligence, and, and actually listening. Not, not pretending to listen, but actually listening. And a, a really cool thing about that whole thing was, you know, when I first got there, they said, if you do this, you, know, you should never be on a phone for more than 20 minutes at a time. If you do it right, you'll be done in 20 minutes or less. And I can remember thinking, yeah, you're kidding me. You know, 20 minutes, that's crazy. Based on what I've seen in the movies, it takes a lot longer than that. And they're like, no, if you, if you do this right, you, you'll be done in 20 minutes or less. And the opportunity to get on the phone and be able to turn people around in 20 minutes or less was just an amazing experience. And uh, it's a master class on emotional intelligence. It was really cool. So if you were to share with the audience today, Chris, I mean, obviously, this was the beginning of evolving into this quality and expert negotiator. What were some of the things that you learned in that initial sort of suicide call center? You know, feeding back to people what you're hearing sounds trite, but it's enormously powerful. I mean, you really kind of understand that if Stephen Covey's advice from way back when, seek first to understand, then be understood. Mm -hmm. You learn actually how to do that. Now, a lot of people get it completely wrong, and they'll say, I understand. And they'll think that, and even if they do, they think that's sufficient. 
And saying I understand to somebody may well be the worst thing you can say to somebody. I mean, it is just horrible. But we think we're doing the right thing when, when we say it. So, you know, getting out of that may have been one of the, uh, one of the first big differences that uh, I started learning how to make. Mm-hmm. So what do you do instead? So you're... Well, uh, you, you, you know, you feed it back to them. You, le- you learn the essence. I mean, there are various components. We didn't break it down into components when, when I was there, and that's what we do now. We understand what those components are, and this applies directly to big conversations and personal conversations. But, you know, there's what somebody says to you, I mean, if you could think of it as, as a beam of white light and you, you pass light through a prism and suddenly it's broken down into components and there are about seven or eight colors in a beam of white light. Well, begin to understand what the components are of what somebody says, you know, what's driving them on a surf, what, what's the underlying, what's underneath anger, uh, what's, un, what's underneath happiness. I mean, every emotion has a flip side, you know, if you hate one thing, you love something else. Being able to understand what those are and, and what feeding that back to someone does. And interestingly enough, that's all backed up by neuroscience. If you identify a negative, somebody's being driven by a negative, and simply call it out, label it, if you will. Neuroscience tells us that diffuses the activity in the brain where negative emotions are happening. So simply calling it out, not denying it, the two millimeter shift in the communications, most people used to deny a negative and saying, you know, I don't want it to seem like I'm a jerk. That's a denial of the negative. When you, your gun instinct is telling you you're being a jerk, or at least they think mm-hmm. you are. And the two millimeter shift is this, instead of saying, I don't want to seem like a jerk, you're going to say, you know, I, I'm sure it seems like I am a jerk. And the second way will diffuse it. And the first way will aggravate it. The denial aggravates it. But the identification or labeling of it diffuses it. It's, and... Nobody believes that that's true. People are horribly afraid to do it like that, and, and it's actually the, the absolute best thing. You can do. Mm, mm, awesome. So, and we're going to get into all your work around negotiations here shortly, Chris. So, you, thank you for that in really helping. It's interesting, you know, as somebody who teaches communications, how few of us actually really listen. <laughs> And really that's hear what that other person true. is doing. So for those of you that are listening to this podcast, you know, take heart. What Chris is talking about is that do we really listen? And your, your, your sound bite and your jam over, oh, I understand. I right away in, internally, Chris, my response and what I was thinking about was, oh, you don't know what I'm thinking. You don't, how, how do, how do you understand what I'm feeling or thinking? So I, you know, right away, you can see the differences on how you're you're feeding that back. So here's the here's the boss, and sh- and she goes and she has you skip over four or five other people. What was the training in this negotiation process at the FBI like? Yeah, it was really cool because when I got down there, you know, I my my suicide hotline skills were really sharp, and I can remember when they first started playing case from us for some actual hostage negotiations. I said to myself. I've been doing this for a year. I just didn't have a SWAT team outside. So I felt very comfortable from the very beginning with the whole process. And then the other thing that was cool about it is it's the only FBI uh, in-service training that there are outsiders at. Like normally you go to an in-service training with the FBI, and there are only FBI agents there, which is I didn't know there were going to be outsiders. And those outsiders are hostage negotiators from across the country and around the world that are experienced and have been involved in actual scenarios. And it, you suddenly you find yourself in the middle of an international community, which is really kind of kind of a cool thing. And mm. people dealing with the same thing around the world. And the other cool thing about that, you slowly realize, the hostage negotiators in Cape Town, South Africa, and Tokyo, Japan, are using the exact skills that we use in the U.S. And you think, you say, wait a minute. How, how, could, how could a Japanese guy and an African guy and an American guy, how could you use the same stuff to get through to all those cultures? And then you learn that it's because human beings are all wired the same. It doesn't matter what their ethnicity or what their gender is. They're going to respond to the same set of skills. And then when you realize you can use this stuff around the world, then it becomes really, really powerful. Mm. Must have been pretty cool to have that group of people there, and I suspect there was just a real connection with other individuals that are doing this from from the globe. 
Yeah, it really was. It really was. And then, you know, you, you share experiences and, and you share that initially, I mean, it's scary, it's a little overwhelming. And, uh, yeah, it's a very cool thing. So what did you, you know, going into it, What take us through shortly, you know, sort of a short version, I guess, of just the training itself and, and what that entails as far as how does a person actually develop these negotiation skills? Yeah, well, you know, you're, you're, you you can be trained. It's not it's not that hard. Everybody's kind of everybody's got a capacity for emotional intelligence. It's just how much it's been brought out of you. And you go to good good instruction, and the FBI training was really good instruction. They told us specifically, here's what an emotion label is. Here's how you construct it, and and here's how you apply it. And they, really, it's exactly the same thing we're doing now in my company, the Black Swan Group. We'll tell you, tell you quite specifically exactly how to construct what you say, and as importantly, how not to construct it. And you can you can make some real uh, there's some real easy mystery, uh, mistakes that can be made if you don't know that you're making those mistakes. Okay, can uh, I'm going to save that right here because I want to come back to that. Make sure that all the listeners you're going to have to hang on for a moment to get all that uh, gems from from Chris. So what you were with uh, the FBI for uh, 24 years. Any stories from that whole experience that you would share with the audience that could help us, you know, the things that you went through there that could help us in our day-to-day lives here as we constantly are negotiating with others or having conversation with others in our day-to-day lives? Wow. Yeah, you know, um, the first time I was, first and only time I negotiated a bank bank robbery with hospitals. Now, the reason why it was the only time I ever did it is because, you know, bank robbery with hostages and negotiations is actually a really rare event. You know, that stuff happens in movies all the time, but bad guys getting trapped in a bank and having to try to negotiate their way out just doesn't happen. They they usually get away Mm -hmm. before the police show up. And the one I negotiated in in New York City, it had been 20 years since a bank robbery with hostages had taken place. You know, I just... I, I use what I refer to as the late night FM DJ voice. But the bank robbers, and there was one bank robber that actually, the ringleader used all the tech of what a great CEO would do in a negotiation. And the, the biggest thing that this guy did was he completely was ducking responsibility and always blaming the other guy from the bank for being more dangerous than he was. He had to do what they said. And, you know, he was really worried about them. You know, a great CEO, when they come to the table, they're going to say, I got a board of directors. I'm worried about my board of directors. You know, what they do, what they do is they're hiding their influence. If, they, if you come to the table and you act powerless, you're a really shrewd, influential negotiator. Because if you act powerless, then they're not going to try to pin you down at the table. But if you take responsibility for the influence that you have, the other side is going to be like, excellent, we got the decision maker here. There's no reason you can't make a decision right now. So a smart negotiator will never never uh, admit that they're the decision maker at the table. And this is what this guy in the bank did when we had him on the phone. Mm. Wow. I've, interesting. I think many people listening to this wouldn't think that's how you want to posture yourself in negotiation. You know, exactly. It's completely counterintuitive. And, that, and that's... That's one of the brilliant things about great negotiations is the really good stuff. Until somebody teaches to you, it's you know what some people call the subtle obvious. It's counterintuitive, but as soon as somebody points it out to you, you know you kind of you hit yourself in the forehead with the palm, palm of your hand and say, "Ah, oh, why didn't I see that before?" I got a I got a friend of mine. He's the uh, he's the head of country for the Development Bank of Singapore. He's the U.S. head. He and I went to high school together. His name is Tom McKay, really cool guy. And what he likes to say, he likes to hire people with flat foreheads. And I'm like, flat foreheads? What are you talking about? He says, the kind of people that pick up on the subtle obvious and go, oh, my God, why didn't I see that before? And smack themselves in the, in the head with the palm in their hand. Because mm-hmm. those are the people that learn. Mm. So just being open to that. So what caused you to... And I'll stop you right there because openness is a vastly underrated attribute. That may be the single key distinguishing characteristic of a great negotiator or anybody that's great at emotional intelligence because 
you're, you're born with the capacity for it, which means you have to be open to learning it, and that's critical. So explain openness, Chris, for us. What do you, what do you well, mean by it, that? It's, it's coachability. It's if somebody disagrees with you, do you say, well, I disagree right back. Or do you say, wow, it's interesting. I, I, I didn't think about that before. You know, you, gotta, you, you have to be willing to be wrong to get better. And some people, there's an old saying, there's 10 years of experience and then there's one year of experience 10 times. Mm-hmm. You know, are, are, you, are you actually getting any smarter? Or, like if I run into somebody and they find out that I coach negotiations and they say, I'm a great negotiator. As a matter of fact, next time you teach a class, you should have me in to talk. That's a closed-minded attitude. Mm. And I know not only that they're closed-minded, but because they are, they stink because <laughs> they're closed-minded. So, uh, you know, I can, use, I can usually spot closed-minded people pretty fast. The growth mindset versus the uh, closed mindset. Excellent, Chris. And so this is the yeah. idea. I mean, even we were talking about Marshall Goldsmith before we got on the, on the show. He said one of the things, the problems with CEOs is that they know everything, right? And uh, well, so it's, some, that, some do. Some I, do. And, and that's, why a lot of, uh, that's why so many companies fail. It's because you're, you know, if you're a CEO, you feel like you know everything. If you work for a CEO that they think they know everything, you should look for another job because that company's going to fail. Uh, we know that the, uh, the mind pool of everybody else is what makes it uh, successful. Well, thank you for that, Chris. Now, when we think about your transition in your career, uh, you were at the FBI, was it close to 24 years? What was really the, the reasons that you were moving out of that now into the business world? Well, uh, after I'd become a full-time office negotiator, because if I didn't describe it earlier, you started out as an additional duty. I went full-time. I got transferred back down to Quantico. That's where the full-time guys work. And then I ended up in charge of our international kidnapping response. And we had a kidnapping that was a long-running, really ugly train wreck in the Philippines. And uh, two out of our three Americans were killed. And two out of three of the remaining hostages were killed in a bots rescue attempt. And, it, you know, I, I was shook. I was a little, you know, as, as you would hope one would be. I remember thinking, you know, either we have to get better at this or i got to find something else to do. Because we did everything that we knew how to do. We did our own internal review on the inside. I always worked as a team. And what we had wasn't enough. So that's when I went to uh, the guys at Harvard, and I kind of said, hey, you know, you want to collaborate? And they let me go through the negotiation course that the law school was teaching, which was their, 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 their signature class. And while I was there, the, the Harvard guys were saying, like, you know, you're doing the same thing we're doing. You're just doing it under different circumstances, but using the same tools. You're dealing with the same set of dynamics. And it was at that point, you know, I began to open my mind to really legitimately. There was somebody on the outside besides me who was thinking this applied to business and personal life. And they ended up, uh, uh, after I went through a class in 2006, when I went back there, I retired from the bureau and I was working on my master's at, at Kennedy School. The law school guys gave me a chance to, to teach alongside them there two years later. And that was really the, you know, the real uh, the gateway out of hostage negotiation into, into business negotiation was via Harvard Law School. Mm. Now, reflecting back on this incident where it just didn't go as well as you'd hoped, and those uh, terrible things happened. Is there anything that you now know today that would have maybe influenced that event differently? Well, um, I, I definitely would use different approaches. Now, whether or not it would change the outcome is a whole second set of questions. Fair enough. Um, you know, what we, what we did, and it's actually a dynamic that happens in a business community all the time. That salespeople have a have a term for it, actually. It's called being single-threaded. It's when the point, your point of contact thinks they have influence with their own team that they don't have. We, uh, we were competing with another company that was handling the uh, application a couple years ago for negotiation training with Verizon. And we found out through the process that fully 50% of the deals that Verizon signs, not that they negotiate, but that they sign, fully half of those deals are never implemented. And that happens because the point of contact does not understand what's going on with their own team, the people that they represent. 
it gets slaughtered in terms of conditions, phases, or, you know, there are, there are deal killers behind the scenes that kill the deals. Deal killers are far more influential on killed deals than decision makers are. You, want, you don't need to know who the decision maker is. You need to know who the deal killers are. And that was what happened to us in the Philippines. And having, first of all, learned that lesson, we changed our approach to that issue in kidnappings that never happened to us. But also, once I got out into the private sector and I started going to sales conferences and hearing people talk about this problem, and I thought, that, you know, single-threaded, that's what, that's what happened to me in the Philippines. Understanding that your point of contact can be completely out of touch with their own team and what to do about it is a critical issue. So let's transition to that, Chris, because this is, you know, an amazing information, is how do you know that that person doesn't have influence with the team without doing some well, investigation first, behind it? How do you figure that out? Indicators to be, one of the first things to be scared of, let's get back to the personal pronoun usage that I was talking about before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if, if, they're, if they're a wee guy, you know, my, our team, the people that are not here, everybody else that's not at the table are really important. That person is probably well aware of the fact that they have a team and they've got, they're probably going to deal with implementation issues. And that's where, that's where things break down. If they're a real I, me, my guy, if they're completely in love with singular personal pronouns, if they rarely refer to them, they are out of touch with their people, you should be concerned. It's like the bartender in a bar, and you ask, you know, I'm a scotch drinker. And I'll say, what kind of scotch you guys got? And he says, you know, I've got doers. Well, he doesn't have doers. It ain't his bar. I guarantee you, a year ago, he didn't work at that bar, and a year from now, he ain't going to be there when you come back. But if he says, you know, I've got, this is what I stock in my bar. That's the same thing. You know, that guy doesn't own that restaurant. He doesn't own that bar. So if they're in love with singular personal pronouns is your first clue. Now, that may not be enough, but it's a starting indicator. And then, you, you know, you've got to hit them with questions that's going to make them think about their team. Stuff like, all right, so how does this affect the people that have to implement this deal? You know, what kind of problems are they going to have making this deal happen? You, call, you ask very specifically designed questions that make them think about their team. And then you repeat those enough times so that finally they get nervous enough, they go and talk to their team themselves. And so getting them to work in the background to make sure that the deal killers don't kill the deal. Yeah. Or, you know, a lot of times the deal killers will kill the deal just because they were never consulted and they're mad. But nobody ever asked them. You know, a deal killer is a, the implementer is like, you're going to hand me this can of worms, and you never once check with me whether or not it's workable or what are the kind of priorities and issues I have. People get really bent out of shape if they're handed something and told to do it, and they might slow walk it on you. And the mere fact that you can get them to talk internally, and, and you can't let them know that's what you're doing, otherwise they're not going to do it. But as, you, as soon as you trigger that internal communication, you're going to solve the vast majority of your problems. Awesome. I mean, for those of you that are listening, make sure you keep that in mind, that you're paying attention to those subtle elements about language matters, doesn't it, Chris? Yeah, it does. And that's almost an oversimplification. So you've got to know what you're looking for, what difference does it make, what, what, what's not being said that should scare you, things like that. So let's go into your book, Chris, and thank you for all of this. You know, never split the difference. You know, when you think about the core principles here, we have about 10 minutes uh, left in the show. And I just, what are some of the core teachings that you have in your book that really can help, you know, the average business owner or professional or individuals that's listening to the secrets of success today? You know, you'd be shocked at how many people just want to be heard out and they'll agree your deal. Two out of three people that you deal with, probably about 75% of your deals. If you just hear the other side out, they're either going to give you your deal or they're going to come real close to it. They just want to be heard. Now, I, know, I know a lot of people say, well, I, I've been in plenty of deals that hearing the other side out wasn't enough. Yeah, the issue is not that those deals aren't still there, but I'm not given an inch if I don't have to. So I don't care, I don't care, what, I don't care if the percentage of deals that I can make are only 5% if I hear the other side out. 
I'm going to take that 5%. I'm going to take whatever that percentage is. And then I'm going to talk about whether or not I have to make a price adjustment. And, and typically, I can make any price in any deal good or bad. It's how the money, how and when the money is delivered. It's how and when the money has to be given back for non-performance. Is there non-performance? Is there performance? You know, I, if, I, if you if you if you got a pair of shoes on it, you really like. And I say, how much for those shoes? And you say, you know what? I want five hundred dollars. And I'll go sold. And I'll take your shoes. And you say, wait a minute, where's my money? And I say, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll give you a dollar a year. You know, Carl Icahn was famous for killing people on the details. The devil's in the details. Carl Icahn give you your price because he knew that you'd drop your guard, and then he would just slaughter you in the terms. And so that that's where the real negotiation is. It's not price. It's terms. Mm. And what else do? Uh some of the errors that people who are responsible for negotiations make in the marketplace or even in life, Chris? Well, you know, first of all, it's, it's not knowing you're in a negotiation. Like the most, we like to say the most dangerous negotiation is the one you don't know you're in. Like most people think they're only negotiating when they're talking about money and they're referring to the haggling process over money. But the commodity that's in every negotiation is not money. The commodity that's in each and every negotiation is time. What are you going to do to get your money? When do you get your money? I mean, time is a critical issue. Time is the commodity. You know, that, that line uh, from the second Wall Street movie, uh, Money Never Sleeps, the, fo- the follow-up to that. Michael Douglas' char- character says, you know, mm-hmm. at the end of the, a- after it all, time is the most valuable commodity. When you now understand that time is your commodity for negotiation, that, that's a game changer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, when we think about things like negotiating with a hiree and so you want to bring this this staff person on or they're negotiating with you for terms what are some of the tips that you teach individuals on both sides of the ledger negotiate success you know everybody assumes the other person understands the job and that they're ready to do that job and vice versa the employee assumes they've done an effective job articulating what they're what they're looking for. That's rarely the case. You know, job description, you know, there's an old saying, um, a giraffe is a horse designed by comp, by committee. Mm-hmm. You know, the job description may be, they may be looking for a horse, but the way they wrote it, it's a giraffe. And you don't know exactly what they want or what the critical elements are. Or maybe the job description as written doesn't lay out your success in a company. So really negotiating success And the issue of salary has a tendency to fall away because if you're wildly successful, you deserve every dime and probably more that they're offering. If you're wildly successful for the company, your salary is going to be a bargain. So it really revolves around what does effectiveness in this job, what does success in this job look like. That will also lay out a real clear roadmap because – a year from now, you're going to be up for review. You will have laid, had the path laid out in advance whether or not you're entitled to a raise or you're not. There should be no doubt in anybody's mind. Now, if you're entitled to a raise and they don't give you one, that's another clue too, which is you got a bad partner. You're in a bad relationship, and you need to move on. Like it, To me, in the issue of women not getting paid as much as men, if you're a woman and you're in a company that pays women less than men, and I was your father... I would say find another job because that company's going down. If they're paying women less than they're paying men, they're a bad company. They got bad strategy. And the truth of the matter is, in ten years, forty percent of the Fortune 500 is gone anyway. And you're in that forty percent that's going to die because they're paying talented people less than they should. So your issue is not whether or not you, how do you get a bad company to pay you more. Your issue is how do you find a better job? Good point. I didn't see that one coming as far as a recommendation for the group. I agree 100%, Chris, is that if, you're, if they're not paying, then that really just shows and reflects the value set of the organization they got a, as well. they got, Yeah, they got a bad value set. They got bad leadership. They're not, they're not recognizing talent uh, uh, appropriately. I mean, again, I, you know, I love, I love the, if, if I may use a father analogy, if, you know, if I had a daughter and she said, Dad, I'm in a bad relationship, how do I turn him into a good man? My answer would be like, you find another man. That's what you do. Mm. 
you're in a wrong relationship. You don't, you don't fix that, you move on. Agree, agree, agree. You don't know how close that comment comes to home uh, this week, in fact. <laughs> okay, all right. Very good. I'm happy. Yeah, so it's, you know, when you think about it, it's a lot of times you're trying to make something that's a, a bad situation good. So this idea of I can always negotiate a win probably is a, is a bit of a misnomer if you're negotiating with the wrong party. Yeah, you know, the job really is to find out what the best options in this instance are. Like, we don't believe in making every deal. We want to find out, is there a deal to be had, and do we want it? Um, we believe, you know, I, we, my company, we're a team. We think like a team. No deal is better than a bad deal. Let me find out what the possibilities are and then decide whether or not I'm going to take it. And I might not take it. And being able to walk away gives you a position of a posturing that's, that's positive. Yeah, and it's an issue of whether or not you're taking yourself hostage. Like, do we have any deals we can't walk away from? Look, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in the U.S., your problems are first world problems. If you got deals that you think you can't walk away from, then you are the one who's taking you hostage. You want to go someplace tough? You know, tr try being a, a regular, a regular human being who happens to live in Syria or Iraq, where they get, and you're just trying to make a living. And Al Qaeda and ISIS and the Syrian government, everybody else is raging around you, and all you want to do is feed your family and and, and have a decent place to live. That's those are problems. Unless you're actually worried about whether or not you're going to die today, and I will admit that there are some neighborhoods in the worst parts of some of our big cities where that's a legitimate concern. But if you're not actually worried about getting killed today, then, then you don't have a deal that you can't walk away from. And be willing to do it as well. So we have don't about... Don't take yourself hostage. Exactly, exactly. Now, Chris, we're going to come back to some final points from you. But if people want to find out more about your work, how do they contact you? Subscribe to our newsletter. That's a, that's a perfect question. That's a perfect way. We got, a, we got a free newsletter. It's complimentary. It comes out every Tuesday morning. It's a short, sweet boost of emotional intelligence, negotiation advice. You know, some newsletters, you get them from people. There's so much content there. You've got to take a nap figuring out what you want to read. You know, our newsletter comes out, and it, it, it gives you a quick, short bite, 500 words or so, on how to get better and apply it today. And it's also the gateway to everything we teach. We've got free content. We've got we have seminar training announcements. If we get something coming up, you'll find it's a gateway to our website that has everything. And your website address That's, is what, Chris? The website is Black Swan. LTD.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D.com. So everybody listening, make sure you go to Black Swan Limited or LTD.com so that you can get any of Chris's information in his newsletter. So Chris, if you were to leave... And if I may, I know I, know I keep interrupting you, forgive me. There's a, there's a text to sign up function for the newsletter. If you send a text, FBI Empathy, all one word, don't let your spell check autocorrect it and make it two words. Send that message, FBI Empathy, to the number 22828. It's 22828, and you'll get a dialogue box to sign, back to sign up for the newsletter. Well, got to love technology as we move into SMS, right? Exactly. <laughs> got to love it. So, Chris, we have all this experience of you, of yours. It's not uh, one year repe uh, repeated 24 times, right? Is <laughs> if, 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 we're, if, if you were to leave just sort of the, your gems or your wisdom and said, okay, I want to be a better person as a result of this podcast. I want to be able to negotiate but also communicate in a more effective manner. What are those top of mind wisdom nuggets that you haven't already shared that would really be helpful in any context? If I'm in business, if I'm negotiating with my significant other, if I'm looking at a job, what are, what are those things that you teach from the stage, you know, every week of the year? Well, you know, a big one is stop trying to drive people into a corner by getting them to say yes. Like if you're asking a series of questions where you hoping they say yes, that just kills rapport. I mean, so many snake oil salesmen out there try to trap people with yes. They call it the yes momentum or momentum selling, and they call each yes a tie down. And wouldn't you like to have more time? Would you like to have, would you like to make more money? Would you 
Would you like to lead a happier life? I mean, those are all traps. And that's done to people so much that trying to get to somebody to say yes is just ridiculously counterproductive. So start, you know, start summarizing what people are telling you. Start hearing them out instead of, instead of trying to trap them with yes. It's just a really bad habit. Don't you hate the word manipulation? That's really what that is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, and you could even be trying to help them out. Like sometimes you just, it's not always manipulation. Sometimes you just try to get them to see something. But the problem is the manipulators have done that to them so many times that it's going to backfire. It doesn't matter what your intent is. You get a great intention and a, a good intention with a bad strategy is still a bad strategy. Fair enough. What would be another one for us? You know, if, if people would just get that one, I mean, that is such a challenge. If you can just stop that one by, your, by itself, I, uh, that's really all you need. I mean, hostage negotiation, emotional intelligence is just really a matter of completely hearing the other side out. And you hear them out by, you know, by, uh, by paraphrasing and, and summarizing what they're saying more than anything else. Friends of mine actually do couple retreats for marriages in difficulty. They actually teach a process called Imago, which, was, which is exactly that is to feed back to your partner exactly what they just said and the words they said it as closely as possible. And it works. It's transformative, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it works. Who would have thought something as simple as that, where you basically feed that back to the individual, uh, would get them to um, connect better? Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's really counterintuitive. It seems too simple to be effective, but it's really, really, really good. And Chris, with your company, thank you for that. With your company, who are sort of your main people that you serve as far as who are your clients? I got to tell you, we, we got them across the board. I mean, we are, we're, we got a construction company that's in all phases of uh, building and renovating, buying land, building commercial buildings, residential buildings, managing them. You know, we got a private equity firm that's got deals across the board. And anybody that's in business, that wants good deals and simultaneously great relationships. And there's some people out there that, you know, they don't care about relationships. Well, I got news for you. We're not for you. We're for we're people in business who want great term, prosperous relationships, great long term partners and great deals at the same time. Mm. Oh, so happy to hear that, Chris, where, you know, uh, relationship is what it's about. And if you actually, I mean, it goes back to the old Zig Ziglar statement, right? If you help people get what they want, you'll get what you want. In really yeah, there's, working you know, there's a lot of classic communication advice that overlaps, and that's absolutely one of those things. So, Chris, any final thoughts that you have for people out here to just to encourage them to increase their confidence as they negotiate but communicate with others, and especially around you know, any kind of difficult things in life? You know, get some, get some low-stakes practicing. You, know, you, you want to learn how to get better at negotiation. You know, don't save it for when it's really important because you're not going to do it. You're going to be nervous. You know, in your, in your little bitty conversations, in your water cooler conversations, in your lunchtime conversations, try some of this stuff out. Try, try paraphrasing people. Try, try hearing them out. Find out when it doesn't matter how effective this stuff really is, and then you'll be comfortable when it does matter. Mm, mm. Wow, wow. Now, your book, Chris, where can we get your book? Never split the difference. You know, never split the difference. I got to tell you, Amazon is where I buy copies of the book to give away. So you're gonna, you can get it in pretty much any bookstore. You can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can get it, you know, at the Hudson Booksellers and, and airports. Um, you're gonna get the best price on Amazon, and uh, I mean that's where I buy them. I mean it's, it's the best price for the book. Well, Chris, thank you very much for spending the time and hanging out with us on Secrets of Success today. It has been my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. You could just stay there with us, Chris, but uh, Secrets of Success listeners, take what Chris has shared with you as far as really, really listening to the other person. Can you feed that back? Uh, I love Chris's final recommendation to you. Why don't we practice this? Why don't we get involved and in even, you know, with your four-year-old, with your significant other, with your friend, your sister, your daughter, whatever, is you start to have these conversations and start paying attention to what you're saying and what they're saying, and you are going to get better at this. Be open to be able to have new uh, strategies, new ideas to be better and more effective with other individuals. You know that some of the work we are doing here at CRG is around emotional intelligence, our assessments, our tools, 
to help you get clear. So look at those, think about those, and apply these so that, by the way, as Chris said, is that true negotiations does not break relationships. It grows them. It develops them. It nurtures them. Thank you for listening to the Secrets of Success podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Ken Keith. Thanks for exploring the secrets of success with us. If you want to keep the momentum going, log on to crgleader.com. Scroll to the bottom and sign up for our inspirational emails. You can also take your success to the next level by following us on Facebook and Twitter and connecting with Ken on LinkedIn. We hope you have a great week and look forward to you joining us next time for the Secrets of Success podcast with Dr. Ken Keyes.